And now we are joined by a surprise special guest, Super Grandmaster and number one in France, Maxime vache le known to the Chess.com fans very well as Leon Beast. Maxime, thanks for joining us and for giving us your thoughts on Game 12. We, yeah, we hello wanted, to everyone. We want to jump right to the position that you feel may have been the, the only possible critical position of the game. Um, you suggested that perhaps Magnus was trying to repeat the success he had against Kromnik. Uh, and if you will, please take everybody through the way, the direction this game maybe could have gone and how Sergei Karyakin improved on Vladimir Kramnik's play. Yes, sure. So, well, Magnus played a uh, noble turn move 15. He played knight a3 instead of the usual knight d2 that he played, for instance, against Vladimir. Mm -hmm. But uh, it didn't make a difference because... Uh, in the game against Vladimir, he went knight g7, knight f1, and the knight went back to e3. So, uh, knight a3 was a kind of a cheeky move order, but nothing, you know, too, uh, too extraordinary. And thus, here comes the critical position. If uh, Sergei had played knight g7... Okay, instead of c6? Yeah, then knight c2 would have been uh -huh. played, I'm guessing. And there, if bishop f5 is played, you take, you play knight e3, and you're back into the Magnus versus Vladimir game. And the point is, here you cannot exchange queens with queen e7 because you're losing c7. Mm -hmm. And thus, after queen d7, rook e1, white gets control of the e file, and Magnus had a really promising position. Uh, I think he didn't win that game, but. Uh, it was very close to winning, but I think right. it was a blitz game, but still. Okay, so but it's interesting that, sorry, just to provide yeah. some context for the fans there. So the details here are that there's a little more going on than people realize that there is this sort of subtle effort, despite how equal the position seems, for Carlsen to grab control over one thing that really matters, which will be the only open file. Um, and and yeah. so how did, so so with the move C6, instead of Knight G7, as, as you said Kronwick did, how oh, is, instead of Bishop f5. I mean, you could play knight g7, knight c2, c6, ah. and it would come back to the game. Uh -huh, okay, but anyway, so... but, okay, let's not talk about uh, obvious transpositions, but just the point is now uh, the only move to prevent Bishop f5 would be knight e3, but mm -hmm. it's nothing too exciting, for instance, after knight e6 and the knight on e3 is kind of out of the, of the way for, for instance, bishop e5. So you might actually answer bishop g5, I'm not exactly sure, right. but it doesn't look too exciting. You can also, yeah, this sounds actually like a better option. Pawn takes in queen g5 with knight f4 to follow. This doesn't look good for white at all. Okay. So, so, so Magnus, seems... Sorry, go Magnus ahead. just went queen d2, and after bishop f5, it took, because, okay, anyway... Like he said, after rook e1, take, take, knight e6. There's really not much uh, that goes on. Mm -hmm. And he, after he took, knight takes f5, knight e3, take, take. You come back to the Magnus versus Vladimir game, except the pawn is on c6. Mm -hmm. Now it's I mean, it's not attacked anymore, so you can go queen e7. And you get control of the e5, or at least you, you're exchanging queen, so, so it's nothing to worry about anymore. And that's exactly what happened in the game, everybody. So the, the subtle details here are, are something that we wanted someone much, much better at chess than me, Maxime Vajay Le Grave, to provide you with some context that there was maybe perhaps a little bit of a fight in mind here um, with this tricky move order, though, as Maxime said, not really a big improvement if the knight's route is coming to e3 anyway. Right, and, and it seems that with, with Karyakin taking this approach to make sure this c pawn wasn't a target, as long as he didn't go right for what Vladimir Kronwick did, the bishops were going to get traded and, uh, and we were going to have a draw. So, so on that note then, Maxime, while we have you, let's ask you, with, with obviously very good preparation from Karyakin, making sure he didn't... Yeah, his, I mean, it was, his... uh, it was good preparation, but it was not groundbreaking, I think. Uh, right. uh, Magnus had tested him much more seriously in the previous part of the match. Okay, but what I was saying is, so if he, you know, with this level of preparation by Karyakin, he improves on his countrymen. Magnus gets nothing as white in the in the final game of the World Chess Championship. How does that? What what taste does that leave in your mouth as a super jam? I think the fans have their perspective about wishing there was something more to this game, or is it is it really not that big of a surprise to you, given how well 
prepared these players come to these things that it eventually came, is coming down to uh, a rapid and blitz playoff? Well, I mean, you cannot have fights in every game. So, you know, going to the game, maybe I'm only guessing, but maybe Magnus felt more pressure than usual and he decided, you know, not to not to leave it to the final game, but to get four rapid games instead. That would make sense. I don't know exactly, but uh, truth is, he probably didn't mind a draw today. And of course, I mean, I would have liked to, to see more of a fight, but uh, uh, we got a f quite a lot of exciting games. We got a couple like this one that were not too exciting, but uh, you know, all in all, uh, there, there were interesting fights throughout the match, and there are hopefully four or even more to come uh, on Wednesday. Well, uh, obviously, you're no stranger to Blitz and Rapid, and we're, we're big fans of it here at Chess.com. You played in our Grandmaster Blitz battles. So uh, what, do you, what do you think the future is? is? Is there a future a thought in the World Championship match itself from the outset uh, being set up to have different time controls, a series of classical games, a series of Rapid, a series of Blitz to provide? I mean, we know chess is very enjoyable when you're playing it, and, and the classical chess will never die in that sense. But for the fans to see something the providing a little more fireworks. Do you think there's something to that theory that the the future of the of the world championship match format should be changed? Well, I mean, it's a question of when because I mean, right now we actually have a setup of you know a world rapid championship. We have a world blitz championship, and it attracts quite a few few names. I mean, Magnus won three of the four last titles they were to take. Uh, Sasha Grishuk took the last one. And, uh, you know, Ikaru played also in Dubai. And, uh, you know, everybody was playing in Berlin except maybe Ikaru and uh, Fabiano and Veselin, I would say. So, you know, this is already one thing. And then about uh, classical chess, I think the level of preparation, of course, is nowadays quite jaw-dropping if you, you know, could evaluate it uh, 10 years ago even, or even five years ago. So, you know, computers got better, mm -hmm. engines got better, and as a matter of fact, uh, in some lines it's clear that the players are stuck. Right. So, I mean, for now we still have, we still have good fights, so, but it probably won't last forever in my opinion, and um yeah, I don't know if in a few years probably the classical time control as we know it will get shorter. I don't know how much shorter. I don't know if you know the classical games of tomorrow will be the rapid games of yesterday, but uh, we'll see something like two, three hours per player per game, mm -hmm. but uh, you don't know, maybe, maybe uh, no, I mean, two hours uh, for, I mean, for both players, like uh, right. one hour per player. Yeah. I, do, I really don't know, but uh, it's clear that uh, we're not going to play seven hour games uh, forever. It's so funny. I'm sure our forefathers who played games for, for days and had adjournments would look at us and say, why can't these kids slow down and play a slower game, right? <laughs> but but now seven hours is seen as way too long. Last question before I let you go. We know this game petered out to, uh, to um, a quick draw, and so that means the match stayed even, gridlocked after 12 games. As a, as a peer of these two guys, uh, you, you played Magnus Carlsen and Sergei Karyakin many times yourself. Uh, are you surprised at how this match went through classical? Surprised at um, the the final result, or did you feel like Sergey Karyakin might have had more chances to frustrate Magnus and, and create this situation coming in? What are, what are your general thoughts on how the match went? Well, I mean, it's no surprise that Magnus was an obvious favorite to win the match, but uh, you know, it's clear that uh, Sergey was not there by accident. He used all his chance. Uh, this is, I mean, uh, even if you remember how he qualified from the World Cup, it was quite a, quite a journey for him there. Because, uh, for instance, I think he went through a lot of tie breaks. He also lost right. the first classical game against Tony Shock. And also, he won a quite decisive game. I wouldn't say against Fabiano in the last round of the candidates because 
that one, you know, uh, he had draws. I mean, draws. Yeah, yeah. Fabiano was in a tough position, yeah. Quite a lot, but uh, especially as he was white. But uh, I think he lost to Vichy in 10th round or something. And then he came back immediately after that and won against uh, Vesmin Toparov. So. So the you fighting know, spirit has been there. The fighting spirit has been there for Karyakov. And the nerves. He knows the ability the to nerves, bounce yeah. back and to create problems. Of course, he defended a lot of tough positions in the process. Uh, not only in the World Cup, but for instance, in the candidates, he had a few very difficult positions against against Fabiano with black. Uh, against... Uh, maybe against uh, Peter Svidler with black. I'm not exactly sure, but he had at least two or three you know, difficult moments where, where he defended very precisely. So, mm -hmm. And, of course, here in this championship against Magnus in games three and four. Right. So, okay. yeah. He's a very worthy challenger, and uh, we'll see how it goes. The, the Tybrex will not be one-sided for sure. He's a, he's a good rapid player too, even though, of course, Magnus is clearly number one is in that... Uh, in that domain as is, you know, reigning uh, double world champion. All right. Well, good thoughts. Interesting stuff. It seems like, uh, it seems like especially amongst his peers, Sergei Karyakin is defended as a, as a rock solid defender with, with, with steel nerves. And he certainly proved that through classical. Maxime, thank you for joining us. We wish we could have had you more, but we know you've been busy this November. Uh, and uh, we we thank you. We look forward to seeing you in future games on uh, Call of the Wild or something. We'll get back to Crazy House. What really matters here, pretty soon. Yeah, Listen, yeah. Check. Crazy House sounds very good. You know? Three check and Bug House and all that stuff. So, uh, thanks for joining us. And the fans will see Leon Beast playing Blitz on Chess.com soon. I'm sure. Yeah, of course. Thank you.